Hi everyone, my name's Eleanor and I'm the Education Manager at Benjamin Franklin House. Welcome to our Ben's Book Club for November. This is our monthly virtual and now sometimes hybrid gathering where we discuss books which relate to Benjamin Franklin, the 18th century and to American history. This month we are so delighted to be welcoming Dr. Lindsay M. Shavinsky, who is a senior fellow at the Robert H. Smith International Center for Jefferson Studies and also a professorial lecturer at the School of Media and Public Affairs, George Washington University. Today, we're gonna to be discussing her recent publication, The Cabinet, um, George Washington uh, and the Creation of an American Institution. Uh, so welcome, um, Dr. Lindsay Shavinsky. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, well, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. So just a little bit about the format, format for today. Um, I'm going to be asking um, Dr. Shavinsky some questions to start with, and then um, about 30 minutes, 40 minutes in, um, we'll be able to hand over to the audience and take some questions. So as we're going through, do um, put down any questions you have either in the chat or in the Q&A, and then we will, we will get to those at the end. Um, so um, Dr. Shavinsky, to begin with, I just wanted to ask kind of how you came to write about this subject. It's a great question. So when I was in graduate school, I knew that I wanted to do something having to do with what we call high politics or sort of federal level government politics, but I wasn't totally sure what. And my advisor suggested that I go read some books on the cabinet to start. And I came back to him quite sheepish. And I said, you know, I, I really can't find any. I, I'm not trying to avoid the hard work. I'm not trying to avoid doing my homework, but I can't find any. And he searched, I don't think he believed me initially, and he searched and then I kept searching. And sure enough, the last book that had been published was on, uh, was published in 1912. And so I realized that everyone just kind of assumed it was there from day one. There hadn't really been a discussion about how this institution evolved. It's not in the US constitution. Um, and I felt that that was really a story that needed to be told because the United States still does have a cabinet today. Absolutely. Um, and then, so could you describe kind of from there, the, the initial idea, the seed, as it were, um, what your research process was like, and then, and then the writing process, maybe editing too? Yeah. So, you know, I mean, every historian or writer that you ask what their process is, you're probably going to get a different answer. Everyone has a really unique process. For me personally, I like to start with a question. And so my question was, where did the cabinet come from? And I had sort of a hypothesis. I thought that maybe the British cabinet was a model or potentially the councils for governors at the state level. And so I set out with my hypothesis and I started going through the archival material. And I realized pretty quickly that both of those options were actually kind of anti-origins. Uh, Washington and the cabinet were very careful to avoid any appearance of being like the British cabinet. They really didn't want that comparison. And in the Constitutional Convention, the delegates had really wanted to make sure that the executive branch didn't look like the governors in the state levels because those councils really limited executive authority. So right away, I was like, huh, shoot. My original hypothesis has kind of been you know, disproven, which is good. That's how the research process should go. So I started digging into uh, what the cabinet meetings looked like, what those interactions looked like, how their conversations were like. And then I went farther back in their own experiences, trying to find some parallels. Where did they get the idea to meet like this? What were sort of some things that maybe influenced their discussions? And it became clear to me that it was really Washington's councils of war during the revolution that shaped his ideas about advisors and leadership and decision making. And that was something that Washington drew into his presidency. So I initially wrote this story as a dissertation, which looks very different than a book and was very thematic and didn't include a lot of the fun backstory and personality things about Hamilton and Jefferson because it was really crafted for a series of experts who already knew that information. Um, so that meant that once I was done with the dissertation, I really wanted this story to read like a narrative. I wanted it to be compelling. I didn't want it to be boring. So I quite literally pulled apart the dissertation sentence by sentence and crafted it into what I thought maybe would be a good narrative. It was not. 
Uh, so then I pulled it apart again, sentence by sentence and organized it chronologically, which is how it is organized now. So I, I basically rewrote it like four times. I don't necessarily recommend that process. If you can rewrite it less than maybe do so, but for the first book, that's what had to happen. And so that's how. Well, it's certainly very, very engaging now. And, um, you know, I think is a, you know, a wider audience can access. So um, definitely worth all, all of the rewrite. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That was definitely the goal. So I, I'm really glad to hear that. Yeah, absolutely. And um, you mentioned about uh, the influence of uh, George Washington's military background, and that is um, kind of towards the beginning of the book, what, what you go into. So I just wondered if you could speak a bit more about the, the influence of that and, and the impact that it had. Absolutely. One of the things that I think I've noticed the most when we as Americans or even international audiences talk about Washington is we either talk about him as Washington the general or as Washington the president. And we tend to treat them very separately. But just like all humans, Washington was very much influenced by what he had previously done, his previous experiences, his failures, his successes. And so I felt that it was really essential to draw that connection to show how the choices from the war really bled into the presidency. So during the war, Washington convened a council anytime he had to make a big strategic decision, whether it was a battle or a retreat or where to place winter quarters, which was actually a really important choice, um, anytime he was going to engage with the enemy, basically. And the point of those councils was, of course, to get advice, but it also was a way to build consensus among the officers, to obtain political cover for a potentially really controversial decision like a big retreat or abandoning New York City. And it allowed Washington to hear from people that maybe he wouldn't hear from otherwise, like local farmers who would know the terrain better than he might. And uh, the, the people that were in these councils, they were big personalities. Mm -hmm. They were not wallflowers and they were sometimes a little bit difficult to manage. So he had some strategies, including making sure that he asked for written opinions after the end of every meeting, if there was disagreement. And these written opinions were essential because they allowed Washington to sort of study the information and make decisions slowly, which was his preference. But also, I mean, he had the evidence about what they said, which was, you know, a really helpful tool. And it allowed everyone to contribute, even if they didn't necessarily feel like going toe to toe in the middle of the debate. And so when Washington entered into the presidency, he quite literally copied and pasted a lot of the practices from the councils directly into the cabinet because it had worked so well for him. So we really see a replica just on a little bit of a smaller scale. That's fascinating. And, I, and I've definitely seen that kind of separation of, of the general and the president. So it was really interesting to see those two roles kind of synthesized and, and the um, cross fertilization kind of brought, brought out there as well. Um, and then you mentioned these these big characters in, in the military that he'd been dealing with. And, and that's another very interesting um, aspect of your book, how um, Washington dealt with the big characters in his cabinet. So perhaps most notably, Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton. And I just wondered, um, you know, what you think about how successful he was in that. And um, yeah, if you could talk a bit more about, about that process. Sure. Well, I think that the way that he had managed his military personalities was a little bit unique to the military situation. When your uh, commander gives you an order, you kind of have to follow it. And the military hierarchy is, is quite strict. And when you're fighting a common enemy, the, the concept of an esprit de corps is a little bit easier to wrap your mind around. So he certainly tried once he was in the presidency, he would host what he called family dinners. So he thought of his secretaries, just like he had thought of his, his officers as his official family. He uh, really tried to solicit all of their opinions. He tried to make sure they knew how valuable he was or they were to him, how much he trusted their judgment. But there were, I think, two main problems. The first was Jefferson and Hamilton from the very beginning disagreed on everything. They had diametrically opposed worldviews about foreign policy, the role of the federal government, uh, where the government should be addressing its energies, immigration, I mean, you name it, they felt differently about a subject. And initially that disagreement was quite respectful and it wasn't necessarily apparent how contentious it was going to become. 
But the more they were together, the more they started to see each other as a um, as a mortal enemy, as, as a mortal enemy to the future of the nation. And so they felt that they had to do something to combat that mortal enemy. So I think that the more Washington brought them together, the more they kind of hated each other. So it backfired a little bit. The other, I think, key element is this was not a military situation. It was not a war. And so there wasn't a common enemy that they could focus on and instead each other became their common enemy. But I mean, that being said, Jefferson started talking about retiring in early 1792, and he didn't actually leave office until December 31st, 1793. So Washington, through a variety of you know, guilt trips and pleas and all sorts of things, was able to keep him in office for an additional almost two years. So it certainly worked, just not as well as the war. Yeah, absolutely. And then, um, uh, of course, uh, a lot of people think about Hamilton and Jefferson, but um, it's interesting, you know, having a small number, just just four members of the cabinet rather than the larger um, kind of body that it is today. Um, so I wondered about the the, the sort of uh, the members that perhaps get less airtime. Um, uh, so Henry Knox and Edmund Randolph and kind of what you think their roles were and how they contributed to these dynamics that were going on. The role of, of Knox and Randolph is something that I really hope people take away from the book is that they were really, really important too, um, especially uh, at different moments in the presidency. So early on in Washington's administration, one of the big issues before France declared war on Great Britain and before the Whiskey Rebellion happened, the big issue is actually the United States relationship with Native Americans. And that was both a diplomatic question, but also a military threat on the Western border. And Knox was primarily responsible for overseeing American policy towards Native American nations. And so he and Washington worked incredibly closely, they talked all the time and had been really close from the war. Knox was one of Washington's favorite officers. So he, I think, kind of gets forgotten because later on, Jefferson says that he disagrees with Hamilton about everything. And so he wasn't important. Whereas Knox had been in the war twice as long as Hamilton had. He had all of the same sort of experiences that led Hamilton to believe a strong military and a strong national government was really essential. So he had his own uniquely formed ideas. They just happened to coalesce with what Hamilton had to say. So I think because of Jefferson's writings and the fact that Jefferson outlived a lot of these guys, we tend to take his word as gospel when I really don't think that was the case. Randolph is a similar situation. He actually outlasted Knox, uh, Hamilton, and Jefferson, and he became the second Secretary of State and was, again, super close to Washington. He had been Washington's private lawyer while Washington was Commander-in-Chief of the Continental Army and then during the Confederation period, and he was by far Washington's closest advisor once the original guys had left, left um, office. But the way that he left office kind of under a cloud of scandal, and then Jefferson's later writings about his uh, lack of strong conviction in the cabinet, which I don't think is correct, really, again, leads us to sort of forget who these people are. But Washington desperately wanted their opinions. Washington desperately wanted them around. And so I generally think we should take his word for it. Yeah, thank you for um, for giving them a bit more um, a bit more focus, and then um, to thinking about the four of them kind of all together, and again about dynamics and the different um, expertise and experience that they brought to the cabinet. I was wondering if you could talk a bit about the Washington selection process, and um, as you said, he he wanted them all there, and kind of the yeah the motivation behind that. Well, this is one of the precedents that I think actually is. Um, often underappreciated that Washington established for the cabinet that continues to this day, well, most administrations to this day. Washington saw the cabinet as an opportunity to bring in a diverse set of voices that represented different ways to be an American. Now, we look at the cabinet today and think that's for white dudes, that's not particularly diverse. But uh, only white men were considered citizens, so the talent pool was relatively small. And at the time, Washington's contemporaries understood that he was picking people from different regions, from different economic backgrounds that represented different economic interests, different sort of uh, industries and trade and religion and education. So really representing all different parts of American culture at that time. And this was quite intentional. 
And of course they had to be experienced and knowledgeable and you know, Washington liked to know his secretaries so that he could trust their judgment. But the fact that he was intentional about trying to bring in people that could speak to different parts of American life and different um, areas of expertise was quite deliberate. And that precedent is something that has continued and expanded, of course, as our definition of who counts as an American has expanded. So over time, people of color, people from different religions, women, uh, different experiences and economic backgrounds have all been slowly, very slowly included in the cabinet as well. And generally, uh, there are a few exceptions, but generally that trend of diversity and inclusion has gone upward over the last couple of centuries. And the, the really, really great presidents that we sort of celebrate on President's Day or in our American textbooks are the ones that did surround themselves with a diverse point, uh, a, a diverse perspectives, diverse uh, viewpoints, because it makes them a better president. Yeah, absolutely. It's so interesting to think that right from the beginning, he, he was setting that precedent. And um, although as a modern audience, we, we might look at it and not, and not not seem so diverse to us, but at the time and um, thinking about the different um, considerations of place being a different sense of place with the states or colonies as they had been until very recently being such separate entities and needing to kind of have representation from, from really different parts of of the states. Um, and then so here, here at Benjamin Franklin House, we're very interested in the, the overlap between um, Anglo-American um, Anglo history. And so um, you mentioned early on about how the British model was really seen in, in many ways. Well, um, Washington was wanted to sort of not be seen to be copying that model. But were there some things that were taken from it, just not in such an overt way? And, and how did that relationship work? Absolutely. So I think one of the things that we have sort of forgotten in the last couple of, of centuries is that Americans initially really blamed the cabinet, parliament in particular, but the cabinet especially as sort of the ruling ministry as being responsible for instigating the conflicts that led to the War of Independence or the American Revolution. And later, of course, the king took on his fair share of blame, but that came after the hostilities had already started. So Americans had this sense that they, they knew that the cabinet existed. They knew that there were people in power, but there was a lack of transparency about who actually had the king's ear, who was making decisions, who was calling the shots. And that led them to believe that it was the source of corruption and cronyism at the highest levels of British government. And at least that was their perception. And so we have to keep in mind that the war ended officially in 1783. When the constitution was drafted, it was just four years later. So this mistrust of the cabinet system is really at the front of their minds still. And they explicitly rejected proposals for councils or cabinets at the constitutional convention because they were so worried about recreating this system. So when Washington entered into office, he of course had been the president of the constitutional convention he had been there for every single session. So he knew very much what the delegates had said about this type of system. And he tried really hard not to recreate a cabinet. He tried all different options and didn't actually convene a cabinet meeting for two and a half years into his administration, which demonstrates sort of how much he was trying not to create this system. Keep in mind, of course, he had loved his councils, but they had been really helpful. So the fact that he was trying so hard not to do that, I think says something to us about his efforts. What's so fascinating when the cabinet actually then does come into existence, right away, Americans borrow the same language. So it's called the cabinet, just like the British version. And everyone is talking about it as the cabinet, except for Washington. He does not use the word cabinet in his letters until he retires. And then he's very quick to say, John Adams cabinet, so he knows that this is what it is called, but he doesn't want to use the word himself. Additionally, what I found to be sort of befuddling is that Americans sort of seem to accept this institution right away. There's no criticism of the cabinet itself. There's only criticism when there is a sense that a particular minister has too much power. So Hamilton starts to be accused of being like Lord North or Robert Walpole. He has too much power. He is interfering in Congress. He's trying to sway legislative affairs through financial legislation. So he receives a lot of criticism, but not necessarily the institution. Mm 
And I think that is a direct holdover of this memory of the British version. That's so interesting that there are these kind of direct comparisons with um, contemporary British politicians and clearly that still very fresh uh, at, at that moment yes. the influence yes, that absolutely. has. Um, and then it's interesting how it's never kind of um, put down in, in the, it's a kind of convention that gets carried forward and what will come on a bit later to perhaps the political legacy of, of the cabinet. But um, again, at, at Benjamin Franklin House, of course, we're always interested in, in links to, to, to Benjamin Franklin as well. And he had a close relationship with, with Washington and also Jefferson. And I just wondered if you had any, any um, ideas about whether that relationship might have had an impact on these later political careers after Franklin's death in um, 1790. Yeah, absolutely. I think that um, Franklin probably had an impact in a couple of ways. So uh, Franklin was pretty outspoken about his anti-slavery ideas. And he was one of the first people that Washington interacted with in a regular and close personal way that felt that way. Um, Washington, of course, was raised in Virginia society. Virginia society was overwhelmingly um, slave owning, especially in the, among the elite families. And so Franklin, I think, was one of the first people that suggested that there was this other alternative. And we see a real shift in Washington's thinking about slavery and Black people in general during the war. He is very impressed by the valor and honor with which Black troops fought and starts to, towards the end of the war, think about his own estate, how he wants to shift things He's no longer buying and selling families in the same way. And then of course, in his will, does emancipate a, a portion of the people at Mount Vernon. So I think Franklin is probably um, one of the people that, that helps him sort of come to that sort of realization. Franklin, of course, also encourages Washington as a lifelong learner. Washington did not go to college in the same way a lot of the other founding fathers did. He was mostly self-educated, and whenever he would have a meal with Franklin, he would usually go buy books that Franklin had mentioned because he wanted to know what people were talking about. And so Franklin was, I think, a great source of inspiration in that way. For Jefferson, um, you know, Jefferson was younger, so by the time he was really a national figure, Franklin had passed away. But I think that the, the concept of being a man of the people, being an enlightened, small-r Republican, someone who is interested in science and math and culture and art and um, all of those different things that they both shared a great deal of passion for, but also not particularly styling oneself as elitist. I think Franklin probably served as a model for Jefferson in that way. Now, Jefferson was as elitist as they came. He liked the finest wine. He liked really good food. He liked fancy architecture and books and spent so much money but he styled himself as a man of the people. And in that way, I think that Franklin was probably an inspiration. Thank you so much, Stephanie. And actually, I should just say that um, uh, sort of Franklin's later sort of more abolitionist views and the influence on Washington, we do have a, um, a book launch coming up later this month um, uh, on this topic. Yes, um, so it's um, George Washington and the Plow, uh, The Founding Father and the Question of Slavery by Bruce A. Ragsdale. Um, this yeah, we're really excited. So kind of just just to just to, I'd mentioned that now. I was gonna save it to the end, but since it came up, um that's Bruce really is a brilliant historian, so I encourage everyone to buy the book and definitely attend the event. It will be very enjoyable. Yeah, we're really excited for this kind of quite different take on 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 this founder. And um yes, it's gonna be Tuesday the 23rd of November. Um same time as this, five five p.m. I think by that time it will be noon in in the yes. states <laughs> after the clocks have gone back. Um, and it's either here in the house, but we're going to be kind of um, broadcasting it live via Zoom as well. So, um, so please do join us for that if you can. Um, I've got a, a couple more questions for um, um, Dr. Stravinsky, but please do. I can see one question come in in the Q and A, but do um, start sending in your questions. We'd love to turn to those as well, either typing them in the chat or in the Q and A box. Um, so coming on now more to uh, Washington's legacy, I wondered what you thought that was of the cabinet, um, how, how it's impacted um, politics sort of from that moment forwards, also politics today, and then a kind of two part question whether you think that um, kind of politicians of the present and the future, you know, what lessons they can learn from Washington's example as well. Well, I think one of the biggest legacies that Washington left, I mean, I think the cabinet is probably one of the biggest legacies and one that we uh, often don't appreciate because the origins weren't particularly well understood. Hopefully they're now better understood. 
Um, but I think one of the biggest challenges is that the cabinet is a very flexible personal institution. It's not written in law, it's not written in statute, it's not in the constitution. And so how it works as a set of interpersonal relationships whether it be you know uh, big meetings, small meetings, one-on-one -on -one consultations, is really up to the president. And the president gets to decide who his, and hopefully someday her, closest advisors will be, how often they'll talk, whether or not the president will actually take that advice. Um, these are all sort of questions that have come out of the way that Washington created the cabinet. And because he turned away from frequent cabinet meetings in the final years of his administration, he established that the secretaries don't have an institutional right to be a part of the decision-making process. They can offer their opinion, but they don't get to demand that they're in the room or demand that the president listens. It's quite different than the British system in which the cabinet is quite literally built out of people from parliament in the winning party in an election. The cabinet secretaries by law cannot sit in Congress. So they have no really institutional authority in how those decisions get made. So what does that mean for sort of the success or failures of presidents? Because it is so flexible, really great leaders who know how to manage men can do extraordinary things with their cabinet. So Lincoln is a great example. FDR was a master at manipulating his cabinet. But weak presidents, weak men who are either ignore their cabinets or are sort of um, bullied by them, it can be a real detriment and it can really undermine an administration. So I actually think that one of the very best ways to understand a presidency is through the lens of cabinet, because it will tell you pretty much everything you need to know about what big events are happening, what are the relationships like, how, how are things working? So in terms of sort of going forward, for how the cabinet works. Um, one of, I think, the, the biggest pieces of advice I gave right as our most recent transition was happening is based on that sort of diversity precedent that we were talking about with Washington, is that really the best cabinets have voices that represent the breadth of the American experience, but voices the president also wants to listen to. So there do need to be good relationships. There do need to be a certain set of shared values such that these are helpful and useful advisors. And that actually makes for the very best presidency. When the cabinet is in the news, generally that's not a very good sign because that means that there is either a scandal or corruption or something has gone very wrong. When the cabinet is functioning as it ought to, all of their successes tend to go to the president and we give the president a whole lot of plaudits for running the administration well. Yeah, absolutely. And it's interesting um, you mentioned that that sort of diversity point and the good relationships. Um, it's very clear, it comes out in the book about the, yeah, the, the prior relationships of Washington and the cabinet members. And um, do you think that in these successful cabinets that have followed that, that that's often a model, the sort of prior relationships are not necessarily just characters that the presidents are able to work well with, or it, it can really vary. I think it really varies. Sometimes prior relationships can be really helpful. Sometimes they can actually be a detriment. If a president likes someone or trusts someone, sometimes they can be blind to their weaknesses or their failures. So Ulysses S. Grant really struggled with this. He had some people in his administration and even secretaries that he had known from the war and he trusted them, he loved them. And so he didn't really uh, see that sometimes they were terribly corrupt. So that's not ideal. Um, there are times, however, when if, you know, for example, Theodore Roosevelt had a, an existing relationship with some of the secretaries in the cabinet that he created, and that worked great. So I think it just really depends on the person. And sometimes, you know, presidents, for example, Lincoln became very close with William Seward, who was his secretary of state. They didn't really know each other beforehand, but they had a great deal of respect for one another, and they developed a really close personal bond. So I think it's really um, an individual case-by-case -case basis. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, so we're, we're, we're ready to kind of hand over to um, our attendees now. So please do get your questions coming in. The, the first question that's come in is actually one that um, I asked Dr. Stravinsky when, when we first got on the call, which is, how did you get a pillow? That's the cover of your book. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's, a, um, it's an excellent conversation starter. So this was actually a gift. A friend made it for me. And uh, on the front, it has the cover and the back, it has all of the blurbs. And I think gosh, I don't remember the website, but I think if you go like, you know, create my own pillow, you can insert your own art. And my goal, as I said earlier, my goal 
eventually um, is to have a whole couch full of pillows of my books um, all lined up behind me. So it'll be a good motivating factor to get the writing done. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, it's definitely very, very striking. And, um, <laughs> Absolutely. Well, um, please, please do let us know um, if you have other questions. I had one last question I almost forgot to ask, which is um, what you're working on currently and kind of your research interests at the moment. Yeah, so I, I did not intend to go chronologically. That will not be the case going forward. But um, as I was finishing up my work on George Washington and trying to figure out what cabinet practices and presidential practices were carried forward, I became really fascinated by John Adams' presidency because um, in some ways, number two is actually harder than number one. You only have the model of number one, so you do, you do have something to go off of, but everyone is going to compare you to who came first. And that comparison was going to be terrible regardless of who was the second president because no one else had the same national reputation or stature as Washington. So Adams has really dealt a pretty crummy hand. And then on top of that, especially in the last year in the United States with our elections and our transitions and the lack of peaceful transitions, I became really obsessed with how did we get this history of peaceful transitions? How did that happen? That is not a guarantee. It is a condition that has to be learned and fostered and cared for. And so the early transitions and the elections surrounding Adams and Jefferson are so important for us to understand and have so many modern parallels. So I'm working on a book on John Adams' presidency. If all goes according to plan, it will be out in 2024, just in time for another presidential election here. Um, but I think it will, um, it will tell us a lot about sort of the origins of our systems and how things emerged the way they did. Brilliant. Well, we're very, we'll be very excited for that. Hopefully you might come back to join us on Friends Book Club. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And we know that, of course, that Franklin and Adams had quite a bit of overlap as well. So there will be lots to discuss there. Oh, brilliant. Um, we have had another question come in, um, this time from Tom McAndrew, who's asked, um, while Alexander Hamilton is quite famous, it was Robert Morris that was Washington's first choice as Secretary of Treasury. Could you speak a bit more about why Morris opted to decline the position? Yeah, that I'm very impressed that you know that. Not many people know that. Um, a lot of people are familiar with the line in Hamilton the musical, which says that you know Washington basically offered Hamilton his choice of treasury or state. That did not happen. Um, Hamilton would have never been considered as a secretary of state because he had no diplomatic experience and that was really essential. So um, you're right that Robert Morris was the first choice. Morris and Washington were really good friends. Washington actually rented Morris's house for the, his term as president, and then Adams basically inherited it. And so Morris moved to a different house he owned right next door. So they were quite close. Um, Morris had staked his personal fortune behind the army to actually make sure that it was paid during the revolution, which is something that Washington never forgot. But because Morris had been so active as a financial person, he had a lot of baggage. He was not particularly popular in Congress. He had served as the finance minister and had demanded a great deal of personal power, which he sort of was able to blackmail his way into getting at the time. Um, but he had made a lot of enemies in that process. And a lot of people in Congress really didn't trust him with the financial apparatus. Um, and then he also personally, his financial fortune was staked pretty heavily on speculation. And for those of you who know the story, a couple of years into Washington's presidency, it started to crumble. And eventually he was actually thrown in debtor's prison. So he was not comfortable heading into this new public position because he really was trying to desperately salvage um, that financial sort of regimen. Um, and so he both turned it down, but also it, he would have been a, a very unpopular choice. Thank you. Um, uh, so we have a question from Kerry Deathorn, um, a curator at the National Park Service in, in Philadelphia. Thank you so much for joining us, Kerry. Um, uh, she says, Lindsay, great presentation. Would you describe your theory of how the physical nature of Washington's Philadelphia home influenced the workings of George Washington's cabinet? Yes, Carrie, thank you so much for asking this question. We've actually talked about this space before and it's a little bit of a pet project of mine to sort of recreate, especially Washington's private study, what that ha would have looked like. So on the second floor of the home that Washington rented, which was called the president's house, there was a small room that was about 15 by 21 feet. It became Washington's private study 
He had a very large desk. He had his dressing table. Um, he had several bookcases, uh, his beautiful globe, which still exists in the Mount Vernon collection, an iron stove, which I think was actually Benjamin Franklin's invention. Um, so he had a lot, he had a ton of furniture. It would have been very stuffed. There wouldn't have been a whole lot of space. And uh, by 21st century standards, it would have felt a little bit like a hoarder's room. Um, this was a very private space. The only people Washington ever hosted in this room that we have record of are the department secretaries. Now, I'm sure his family members sometimes came in and out. We know that some of the enslaved members of the household came in and out to help Washington with his hair or his shave or to clean. But in terms of work meetings, the only record we have of people meeting there were the department secretaries. And this makes sense when they were talking about, you know, matters of state, it would have been the most private space. It was a very intimate room. It would have conveyed a sense of intimacy. But I think because it was so small and so intense and they met there so frequently. So in 1793, for example, the cabinet met up to five times per week, sometimes several hours per day. And at this point, Hamilton and Jefferson despised one another. They hated each other. And as I said, they really thought that the other was a mortal threat. And so, and yet they were stuck in this room without air conditioning in Philadelphia, which anyone who's been there knows it's a, not a pleasant time to spend uh, in the summer, not a pleasant place to be in August, to be meeting several times per week in this room. And so it almost functioned as like a hothouse for political tensions. Now, I think that political parties would have happened either way. And I think that Hamilton and Jefferson were destined to sort of disagree with one another. But I think it happened faster because they were in this room all the time. Oh, that's fascinating to think about the influence of, of place and space. We think about that a lot at, also at Benjamin Franklin. Yes. Um, so thank you for that wonderful question. Um, another question's come in kind of linking more to sort of present and, and politics today. So um, question is, uh, thinking of modern government and with the gift of hindsight, do you think there's anything Washington would do differently with the cabinet and the precedents he set? Oh, that's a good question. Big question. <laughs> big, big question. Um, not too many people ask me what Washington might have done differently. So it's an interesting angle. So I appreciate that. I think one of the challenges of the cabinet today, it was, it was true then too, but especially today, is that cabinet secretaries actually wear two hats. They are both managers of enormous bureaucracies and they are advisors. And uh, people who are good managers are often not necessarily the best advisors and vice versa. So a president really has to take into account those two different qualifications, and that makes it very difficult to have an effective advisory body and well-functioning bureaucracy. So I think that if Washington knew that that's how things were going to go, he would have structured the advisory portion of that differently, such that the advisors were not also responsible for overseeing sometimes millions of people, the State Department um, and the Defense Department are huge entities. And so um, I think that that's probably the biggest challenge that he would see and he would have tried to do something differently there. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you so much for being such brilliant questions. Um, uh, yeah, do we do have a few more moments if anyone else wanted to, to ask any questions? We're so grateful again um, to Dr. Javinsky for, for joining us this afternoon. I can see one, one question coming in. Um, uh, so Hannah Ryan asked, do you think that Washington was fundamentally a vehicle for Hamilton's ideas? Oh, that's a fun question. Mm -hmm. um, no, I don't. So I th think that this is one aspect that maybe has been a little bit overblown um, because of the musical, which I love, huge fan. It's phenomenal art, uh, but it is art. Um, and so anything that I can do to increase interest in history, I'm all for. Um, however, Washington certainly did not have sort of his own, he was not a financial genius in the way that Hamilton was, that he could come up with new structures or new ideas, but he understood what Hamilton was doing. And he often turned down Hamilton's ideas on certain things or sided with Jefferson against Hamilton. He was actually pretty deliberate of almost like going back and forth. Um, and especially on things that were not necessarily strictly financial. So Hamilton had a lot of big ideas about diplomacy and Washington sometimes thought he was nuts and he was sometimes nuts. Um, he had a lot of big ideas about enforcing executive authority and he often wanted to go way farther and faster than Washington was willing to go. 
So Washington certainly trusted him, certainly had a lot of respect for his intellect and his suggestions, but Washington was always the one to make the final decision and everyone in the administration knew it. So there was no question that, at least within that room, he was always the one that was gonna make the final call. Yeah, that's um, um, one last question for me, unless any, any other questions come in. I'm just thinking about um, the role of the president and, and the executive and, and the amount of power that's, that's contained within that. Um, what kind of precedence do you think Washington sent there? Um, uh, you know, being this, this, this huge figure, as you mentioned, very difficult to follow for John Adams. And um, so not just with his cabinet, but kind of on a, on, in a wider sense. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, there's there's so much. Um, I encourage everyone to look at the U.S. Constitution and look at Article 2. It's very short and it says very little, um, and especially in terms of what a president is supposed to be day to day. So in a lot of ways, the presidency really was Washington's creation because he had to figure out all of the fuzzy details that had not been written down. And that was sort of by design. The delegates either didn't really want to talk about it in front of him or were tired and just didn't just decided to basically say, you deal with it once you're in office. So, so much of the system is something that we've created from him. I think there are a couple of things that we often take for granted because they're not, they're really hard to quantify. Washington knew when not to say something, when not to do something. He showed incredible restraint time and time again. And that's not as sexy as winning the civil war or winning world war II or any of those things, but it's really important that the president doesn't get involved in everything. Uh, sometimes that's, I think, a, a trait that we no longer appreciate like we should, but is a, a really important part of the office. Similarly, Washington felt that the office needed to be filled with a certain level of decorum and prestige in order to lead the entire executive branch. And again, we sort of talked about the enormous executive authority, and that was absolutely Washington's creation too. But he thought that it should be handled with a certain amount of gravitas. and that is a, a norm and a custom and something that takes a long time to build and to cultivate. It's not written down, but we see the value of it when we have presidents who don't abide by that sort of code of conduct. And it feels really wrong to us. And we're not always sure why, but it's because we expect the office to sort of embody the best of what we would like the United States to be and to be a good representative on the world stage and to speak for the appropriate American values. And um, that I think really started with Washington. Fantastic, thank you so much. It's been just so enlightening um, hearing you speak. Thank you so much for joining us on, on Ben's Book Club. Um, I've just uh, been, I've been reminded that actually our um, talk with um, Bruce A. Ragsdale, it's 6 p.m. UK time. Okay. So it is 1 p.m. US time. <laughs> So please do join us for that if you're available on Tuesday, 23rd November. Also next month, our Ben's Book Club for December, we are really excited to be welcoming Karen Cook-Bell, um, who's going to be talking about her recent book, Running from Bondage, uh, Enslaved Women and Their Remarkable Fight for Freedom in Revolutionary America. So we're keeping with um, the revolutionary period. That's on Wednesday, 15th of December. And that, that one is at 5 p.m. UK time, 12 p.m. Uh, noon uh, US time. So we hope you might be able to join us for those. And once again, um, Dr. Vinci, thank you so much for joining us and for your discussion. Thanks so much for having me and thank you all for being here. Thank you, everyone. See you soon. Goodbye. <laughs>